So hello everyone. I think uh, we can reconvene uh, since uh, we have already accumulated a few minutes. And uh, I am happy to welcome our next speaker who is Andrea Pum. And uh, Andrea will tell us about uh, celestial diamonds, several things that happen there, asymptotic symmetries, double copy, and conformal dressings. Uh, Andrea, you have uh, 25 minutes plus five minutes for questions. Please go ahead. Thank you, Lorenzo, for the introduction. And uh, thanks a lot uh, to the organizers for the opportunity to speak at this conference. So the S matrix is our basic observable for quantum gravity in asymptotically flat space times. And since we can use on-shell data to learn about, about physics, it has some sort of holographic flavor. But this comes, becomes particularly crisp when realizing that there is a convenient basis where we replace the momentum by boost eigenstates in which the S matrix takes the form of a celestial correlator, a conformal correlator uh, of operators that live at the boundary of the space-time. And this equality here is at the heart of the so-called celestial holography program, which attempts to apply the holographic principle to asymptotically flat space-times. Now the question about flat space holography is old, um, but recent observations and insights have refueled this program. And the observation was that soft theorems in quantum field theory and what identities of asymptotic symmetries, which both are themselves rather old programs, are actually related and can be regarded as equivalent. And what's more, the generators of these asymptotic symmetries, they look like currents that live on the celestial sphere. And this gives the hope that at the boundary of asymptotically flat spacetime, there might be a celestial conformal field theory living from which we can infer, infer um, uh, about the bulk physics. Now, if you're not interested in holography, you might view this equality as a CFD-inspired approach to amplitudes, where we can ask, are there CFD bootstrap-style machinery to compute and constrain scattering? So far, this program has been bottom up, and a few entries in this uh, holographic dictionary have been found. For example, collinear limits of amplitudes give rise to the OPE data in celestial CFD. Um, the celestial analog of soft limits constrains uh, scattering of celestial amplitudes from symmetries and provides conformal dressings for amplitudes. And then an interesting aspect is that these celestial amplitudes pr probe all energy scales. And so we need uh, to know something or learn something about UV physics. And this gives a potentially interesting uh, place for, for string theory for quantum gravity. Now, this is the plan of my talk. So I would like to discuss a natural structure that occurs in celestial CFD, which unifies the discussion of soft physics. So essentially, there will be a diamond-shaped structure whose corners give rise to the celestial analog of soft theorems, the associated soft charges of asymptotic symmetries that are spontaneously broken by the vacuum, and conformal dressing for celestial amplitudes. And along the way, we will uncover that a celestial analog of the double copy, both in a perturbative and a classical form, appears. And interesting finite backgrounds, such as ultra-boosted black holes and shock waves, appear in this diamond structure as well. Most of what I will talk about will be based on these three papers up here, um, which have been written with Sabrina Pastersky, who is a postdoc at Princeton, soon to join uh, faculty at PI, and with my postdoc, Emilia Trevisani at uh, Ecole Polytechnique. And then along the way, I will also mention um, some earlier work with Edu Eduardo Casali from last year, and uh, some upcoming work with Sabrina and with my student, Yoko Pano. Okay, so before I talk about celestial diamonds, let me talk about some other diamond uh, structure first, namely the Penrose diagram of Minkowski space and the associated symmetries of the space time, which is always a good starting point for a problem. So um, in four dimensions, which is what I will restrict to for the purpose of this talk, we have the global time and uh, space translations, and we have the Lorentz group, which gives those rotations and boosts. And I've written the Poincaré generator here in uh, Bondi coordinates, which are useful coordinates for discussing the physics that happens near the conformal boundary of the space time, which I've drawn here in blue. So this is, uh, at this place, the radial coordinate goes to infinity. And then these coordinates, these light light coordinates u and v, are useful for parametering, parameterizing square plus and square minus. And complex coordinates z and z bar would parameterize the true sphere at uh, null, null infinity. Now, it has been found that when um, we want to consider space times that allow, for example, the passage of gravitational waves, which is something that has been talked a lot about in the conference and uh, still uh, continuing to be talked about, 
then we have to relax the boundary conditions of asymptotic flatness. And in particular, what um, Bondi, Vandenberg, Metzen, and Sachs found in the 60s, that when um, suitably relaxing these boundary conditions, the symmetry group um, gets enlarged, and it gets enlarged by an infinite amount. Um, there's a beautiful story there, uh, which I don't have time to talk about, but the punchline here is that the translations on the Lorentz transformations get infinitely enhanced to so-called BMS super translations and super rotations. And this function f on this vector field yz, which for the global translations and Lorentz transformations took particular values or particular form in terms of the angle coordinates on the sphere, now can be arbitrary continuous functions on the sphere. And moreover, we will also allow for poles um, in the angle coordinates. And as I mentioned before, the asymptotic symmetries, um, which are these BMS super translations super rotations, they manifest themselves in scattering amplitudes in the form of soft terms. Now, talking about scattering, um, let me uh, explain a bit more the map that I showed you on one of the first slides, which takes the 4DS matrix to a two-dimensional correlator. And for the purpose of this talk, I will restrict myself to massless scattering processes for which this map takes a particularly simple form. And it's just given by a Mellon transform, which is this uh, blue integral transform in the energy, and it gets applied to every external particle in the scattering amplitude. Now, these are uh, characterized by a full momentum or equivalently by an energy omega and a null vector q, which depends on a point on the celestial sphere and the particle helicity. And these amplitudes get mapped via the Mellon transform to a correlation function of operators, which get inserted at points w and w bar on the celestial sphere, and which carry labels, which are the quantum numbers under the symmetry group. And the symmetry group is the global conformal group on the celestial sphere, which arises from the action of the four-dimensional uh, Lorentz group um, on the celestial sphere. And these labels here are the conformal dimension and the two-dimensional spin. Now, how do these operators arise? So to define these operators, um, we can start with a four-dimensional bulk operator, which we expand into modes, for example, in, uh, in energy basis, where, where we expand into wave functions and the creation and annihilation operators. And we take an inner product of these operators of spin S in the Heisenberg picture um, with a particular kind of wave functions, which I will define in a moment. And this inner product here, uh, which is denoted by these brackets, uh, corresponds to an integral over a Cauchy slice sigma in the bulk. So it integrates out to the space time uh, vector x. Um, for example, for scalars, this would be the Klein-Gordon inner product, um, which, if you recall, contains a complex conjugation, and which are these star and the minus sign appearing in the labels here. So in this way, we can uh, obtain a two-dimensional operator that just depends on the boundary points. It has a label S for the four-dimensional spin. It carries the quantum numbers of the 2D conformal group, and it has this plus-minus label which distinguishes between in and out states. And this is selected by a suitable uh, analytic continuation of these wave functions here, which I will now define. So what I will call conformal primary wave functions are wave functions that depend on a bulk point X that uh, transforms on the, on the Lorentz group and the boundary point WW bar, which transforms under the 2D global conformal group, so under Möbius transformations. And I will define these conformal primary wave functions by demanding that they transform as four-dimensional spin S fields on the Lorentz transformations and as two-dimensional conformal primaries with conformal dimension delta and spin J. And uh, in the easiest sense, uh, they are gauge equivalent to a Mellon transform of the plane waves dressed with a suitable number of polarization vectors epsilon. And the transformation property that I have stated here in words is given by this equation here. And there will be essentially two uh, forms of conformal primary wave functions that I will consider. One is uh, radiative wave functions, where the two-dimensional spin is equal to plus or minus the four-dimensional spin. And this will be required to solve the linearized equations of motions for spin S particles. But then I can also relax this condition and, for example, allow for sources or distributions. And these will be called generalized conformal primary wave functions, whose magnitude of the 2D spin can be smaller or equal than the four-dimensional spin. Now, if the external particles are in such boost eigenstates, then S-matrix elements that are constructed by this Mellon transform transforms by construction as a correlator of quasi-primaries. So this is that statement here, where the 2D spin here is identified with the helicity in 4D. 
Now, um, if the conformal dimension of uh, the operators involved um, is on the principal continuous series of the Lorentz group, which is uh, essentially this expression here, and which captures finite energy radiation, then this, can, this transformation can easily be inverted as given here. But for celestial CFD, it will be of great interest to um, move away to analytically continue from uh, the principal continuous series to the general complex plane or to fully real conformal dimensions. And I will talk more about this later. Um, but let me make another point here, which is that translation symmetry, which is manifest in a momentum basis, now it gets obscure. And the momentum operator uh, becomes a differential operator um, whose effect is to shift the conformal dimension of an operator by one. Now you can ask uh, what happens now to properties of amplitudes that exploit manifest translation symmetry, such as the double copy, which we have already heard a lot about in this conference. So um, the statement there um, that the kinematic numerators of an n point uh, Jan Mills amplitude squares into the kinematic numerator of an n graviton amplitude makes use of the fact that we have this four dimensional energy momentum conserving delta function here. But if we use this delta function to perform all these integrals of these n external particles, then it does not look as if there was a, a natural squaring relation between celestial young mills and celestial graviton amplitudes. Now it turns out that there is, but what one has to realize is that these kinematic numerators, which in a momentum basis are functions of the polarization vectors and the momentum, or in particular the energy, in the new conformal basis have to be understood as um, operator valued expressions that act on scalar wave functions, that act in particular on these conformal primary uh, wave functions. Um, for details, I refer you to this talk from last year. Uh, let me just give it a punchline. So once you've realized that we have operator valued numerators um, that act on amplitudes of scalars, we can uh, do a generalization of the usual prescription, which is that the color factors in the, young, in the celestial Young Mills amplitude get uh, replaced by another set of operator valued numerators and the celestial graviton amplitude then appears as the square of this uh, operator valued expression acting on amplitude of scalars. So in this way, we can get the celestial analog of the um, perturbative double copy. And um, this gives another uh, evidence uh, for uh, the belief that the double copy is a fundamental property for of gauge and gravity amplitudes and does not um, rely on using a particular basis. And moreover, because we can pull out these operators in front of any uh, scalar amplitude, they don't depend on space time. And so perhaps they uh, can help us pave the way for um, understanding of a generalized curved space double copy. Okay, so now I wanna go back and talk about the building blocks of the celestial CFD, um, which starts uh, with the melon transform of plane waves which already give us um, the first ingredient, which are scalar conformal primary wave functions. So these depend on the spacetime vector X and this null vector Q, um, which embeds the complex plane or, or the sphere into the um, four-dimensional light cone, and which also gives us natural polarization vector by taking um, derivatives with respect to the sphere coordinates W and W bar. And I've dropped here this normalization factor involved in the gamma function. Now, to construct uh, conformal primary wave functions of higher spin, it is useful to introduce a null tetrad for Minkowski space, um, which is given by the set of four null vectors, and um, furthermore, decompose it into a spin frame in order to discuss uh, half integer um, conformal primary wave functions. Now, um, once you've realized this, um, and the fact that these, this null tetrad and spin frame have or these, these elements all have conformal dimension zero, but definite um, 2D spin um, under the SFC Lorentz group, then there's a very compact way to um, write down all the spin S wave functions between zero and two. And I draw attention to the fact that um, in, in all these wave functions with uh, spin bigger equal than one, we have this space time dependent polarization vector. If we just had the usual polarization vector that we would use in a momentum basis, then um, the wave functions that you obtain would not be conformal primaries, they would just be gauge equivalent to conformal primaries. Okay, so these wave functions are now bona fide conformal primary wave functions that satisfy all the properties that I mentioned before. And now I would like to um, emphasize two things about this basis of wave functions. One is that in theories with supersymmetry, um, primaries that, are, that differ by a half integer 
can be related by the action of the supercharges, which are essentially um, these differential operators, which are a square root of the momentum generator. And the other thing that I want to point out is that the formal primary wave functions, they satisfy a care shield double copy. So it turns out that these uh, spin two uh, wave functions, which have originally been constructed as solutions to the linearized equations of motion, are actually exact solutions to Einstein's equations. And this null vector from this tetra that I called M here turns out to be the Kerr shield vector. And these uh, space times are algebraically special. They are of pattern of type N. And when the conformal dimension of this spin two uh, matrix is zero or one, they become even type O. And uh, I will get back to this point because this is what relates to asymptotic symmetries. Okay, so very nice. These conformal primary wave function have a very uh, nice and compact structure. Um, but what's more is that we can also obtain conformal primary uh, metrics um, that are uh, physically interesting for various purposes. Um, and that is the case when uh, we go from radiative to generalized conformal primary wave functions. So when the 2D spin does not have to be equal to the 4D spin. So for example, the Eiffel book Sexual Shockwave or Ultra Boosted Schwarzschild black hole written in this form can be recognized to be a generalized conformal primary metric. So this expression has a definite conformal dimension delta, minus one, and definite to the spin j, which is zero, so it's smaller than the 40 spin, which is two. Um, and there are other examples, for example, the Drey Toft planar shell, beam like gravitational waves, or ultra boosted Kerr, which also fall into this class of metrics that have definite uh, conformal dimension and 2D spin. And so, what uh, would be an interesting problem here is to uh, exploit amplitude methods to explore non perturbative bulk physics with having in the back of our minds that we want uh, to study them from the point of view of celestial CFD. Okay, so now I've talked already about um, uh, soft limits and the fact that they relate to um, asymptotic symmetries. And now that I've introduced some of the ingredients in this uh, conformal basis, I can tell you that the soft limits that appear at different orders in the zero energy expansion of an amplitude um, gets mapped to conformally soft poles in the complex delta plane. So for example, Weinberg soft graviton theorem, which has as the leading expression a pole one over the energy, gets mapped to a factorization theorem of celestial correlators, where the leading term is a pole that appears at the value of delta equal to one. What's more here is that the relation between this higher to lower point uh, celestial correlator involves a shift of conformal dimension of the other operators that are not taken soft. And the origin of this uh, can easily be understood when remembering that the translation generator is what shifted the conformal dimension of operators by one. And the relation is that um, the leading soft graviton theorem um, is equivalent to um, BMS super translation symmetry. And uh, the fact that conformal dimensions of the hard operators here get shifted is encapsulated by this operator product that I've written down here. So the celestial um, super translation current is one example of a asymptotic symmetry current that um, lives on the celestial sphere null infinity, but there are several more. Um, and they all come from, um, or can be understood from this two dimensional operator that is obtained by taking an inner product of a bulk operator with the corresponding wave function. And for this 2D operator to be a symmetry generator, these wave functions um, are become pure gauge. And this table that I've um, written up uh, on the top here uh, lists um, the pure gauge conformal primary wave functions for spin one, three half, and two. So in this table, I've already talked about super translations and super rotations, but there's also a largely one gauge symmetry, which appears for the spin one field when delta equals one. And there's an infinite enhancement of local uh, supersymmetry, which appears for the gravitino when delta is one half. And because conformal primary wave functions satisfy a partial double copy, we can understand um, BMS super translations or the BMS uh, group in some sense as a square of large one gauge symmetry. This is a statement that has already been made, but in this conformal basis, it comes out naturally. There's also a double copy between super rotations and a spin one mode, but this spin one mode is not pure gauge. However, um, as I will um, discuss in the following, um, while from the asymptotic symmetry point of view, these two tables do not appear to be on the same footing. Um, although both uh, entries in these tables give rise to soft theorems, the structure in celestial CFD is such that it captures both 
pure gauge and non-pure gauge wave functions at the same time, which gives rise uh, to soft characterization theorems. And we'll get to that in a second. Um, let me also mention that in 2D CFD, we can um, uh, do an integral transform that's called a shadow transform, which essentially flips the spin and it shifts and flips the conformal dimension. And we get wave functions that have corresponding tables that give rise to soft factorization properties. And highlighted here in the upper table are two entries. One um, gives rise for the gravitino, for the shadow gravitino, let's say, gives rise to supersymmetric current. And the other one is a dimension two graviton, which gives rise to, to a stress tensor for celestial CFD. And again, we have a table that where the wave functions become pure gauge, the special values of the conformal dimension, and one where it's not pure gauge. So now I have assembled a lot of ingredients um, to tell you about the unifying structure um, that arises from the celestial CFD point of view. So we have learned in our conformal field theory class that if we have a primary state uh, denoted by H and H bar, um, those are just the weights that uh, are equivalent to the conformal dimension delta and spin J, um, that a primary uh, state gets annihilated by the action of L1 and L bar 1. On the other hand, we can get descendants by the action of L minus 1 and L bar minus 1. And these descendants become primaries themselves if these weights H and H bar take particular values. And those are written uh, out here. If both H and H bar take the special values, if may, then- Andre, if I may interject, you have a little less than five minutes at this point if we want to have time for questions, sorry. Good, I, I, I noticed, I, I saw your video, thanks. Okay, Okay, so Great. starting with the special primary at the top, um, we can now get a nested structure of primary descendants. So we can descend to the left and to the right with these uh, generators which uh, um, from the celestial CFT point of view are nothing but uh, taking partial derivatives with respect to the two-dimensional coordinates, W and W bar. And then we land on primary descendants. And then we can uh, act furthermore with these generators and uh, until we complete this diamond-shaped structure with another primary descendant at the bottom. So these, uh, this structure, we call them celestial diamonds for uh, obvious reasons. And um, they encapsulate uh, very nicely uh, the physics of the conformally soft sector. Um, so these are examples uh, for the pure gauge modes that give rise to asymptotic symmetries. So on the left we have the leading soft photon and graviton uh, celestial diamonds where the left and right corners are these pure gauge modes, these pure gauge weight functions. Um, these are symmetric while uh, the diamonds for the leading soft gravitino and the sub leading soft graviton are chiral and the way they are tilted depends on the chirality and the helicity of the wave functions. In each case, the left and the right corners are these radiative conformal primary wave functions which become pure gauge. And the diamond is completed by adding at the top and at the bottom generalized conformal primary wave functions. And let me just mention in passing that um, the shock waves that I mentioned before would reside at the top corner of associated uh, memory diamonds. So diamonds that uh, give rise to memory effects. Now, there's also these non-pure gauge modes, which nevertheless gives rise to soft theorems. And these are also captured by celestial diamonds, but now they are degenerate. So they have zero area. And uh, this means that there are not four corners, but only two appearing. And both of those corners, which are marked by these dots, are radiative conformal primary wave functions. And moreover, one of them, one uh, dot uh, is a conformal primary wave function, and then it descends to a shadow conformal primary wave function. So that's the structure of um, all the uh, conformally soft uh, particles that give rise to soft factorization theorems. And they are nicely unified by this uh, celestial CFT language uh, of descendancy relations. Now, um, just to mention a little bit about the bottom and the top corner. So and let me do this for the cases of super translation and super rotations, where here I've just drawn the celestial diamonds for the operators associated to the wave functions um, that become pure gauge. In blue here, I've written out what are the soft part of the conserved charges associated to the symmetries. And as you can see, what I've um, encircled in red here are these uh, symmetry parameters, this function f and this vector field yz, which appeared at the very beginning of my talk. These arise as the asymptotic values of these pure gauge conformal primary wave functions um, that correspond to super translations and to super rotations. And what else is appearing in this integral here, which is an integral over the celestial sphere, is an operator 
um, which are called OSOF, which from this diamond-shaped structure, you can recognize to reside at the bottom of these celestial diamonds. So these operators are actually primary descendants, which you can see from the fact that there are derivatives acting on the annihilation and creation operators in these uh, gray expressions here. And those are what uh, determines, in a sense, the soft charges associated to super translation and super rotations. So this is the physics of the bottom corners of these celestial diamonds. And now let me mention a few words about the top. So um, there are these body of cooler stressings which render infrared divergent amplitudes finite by dressing their particles with some uh, dressing called W here. And it turns out that um, when there's a function in here, which uh, if you pick it to be one to take a special value, then um, the, ex the expression for uh, the dressing takes a particularly nice form in the conformal basis. So what we have in here is uh, P at the hog momenta and J at the angular momenta. And what, be the, what would be the leading dressing in these expressions are these factors in P, and the subleading part would be those factors involving J. And this is in correspondence with the fact that the leading soft Raviton theorem corresponds to momentum conservation at every angle and the subleading one to angular momentum conservation at every angle. Now, if you take this expression to the conformal basis, what you will find is that the leading um, conformal soft dressing is given by this curly uh, Z here, um, which was discussed in this paper. And then the subleading dressing is determined by this curly Y. And it turns out this, that these operators, uh, curly C and curly Y, are actually Goldstone bosons that reside at the top of these uh, celestial diamonds and which can be obtained from an inner product um, with generalized conformal primary wave functions. And the interesting aspect of this here is that the leading uh, conformal soft dressing renders the celestial amplitude finite and gives rise to levels in celestial CFD, while the subleading dressings descend to the dual stress tensor and therefore give rise uh, to central extensions in celestial CFD. So with this, let me summarize. Um, I've tried to uh, convince you that celestial diamonds reveal the power of symmetry to organize components of physics um, and by supersymmetry, they stack in, into even bigger structures, um, which will be in upcoming work. Um, I've told you a lot about uh, conformal primary wave functions and amplitudes and the way that they, the double copy arises. And I've also um, talked about finite um, uh, backgrounds, uh, which also arise in these diamond shaped structures. So for the future, it would be really interesting to combine tools from amplitudes, classical GR and CFD in order to gain insights from into bulk physics from the celestial holography program. So thank you very much. Thank you, Andrea. That was a very nice talk, very clear. Uh, so we are open for questions. We have a few minutes or questions to add. Okay. Simon? Yeah, uh, thanks a lot, uh, Andrea, for the nice talk. Uh, okay, I have two questions actually. One is about the, uh, can you explain that uh, the, the symmetry generators uh, acting on, on, on the vacuum, they, they, they have uh, special quantum numbers. They are, does that mean that, uh, I don't, can you relate uh, this to, does that mean that when you evaluate the celestial amplitude for graviton with a certain uh, melon moment, uh, a certain, you reproduce these charges? So how, how is this related to the gravitons? Yeah, so, um, so the charges uh, arise from these integrals. And uh, as you uh, correctly point out that, so, okay, let me, let me start here maybe. So um, the way that asymptotic geometries uh, act is that they shift the bulk fields by an inhomogeneous term. And the inhomogeneous term, as I indicated at the beginning of the talk, um, is related to these asymptotic symmetry parameters, f and yz, for the case of super translation and super rotations. And those can, in general, be arbitrary function on the sphere, arbitrary continuous functions. Now, it turns out that in the conformal basis, in some sense, you pick a gauge. And this means that the, uh, in principle, uh, arbitrary function of the angles that would arise here on the right hand side of this uh, commutator is a specific function of the angles. And the specific function is one that I've, I've written down a few slides before. Now you can always um, take a convolution on the celestial sphere to turn this into another function. But the, the way that, the right, that uh, these uh, symmetry generators arise is uh, in this particular form. Now, I'm not sure this answers your question. 
Um, but maybe let me uh, emphasize one point here that I didn't make is that, uh, so these soft charges um, are written as the symmetry parameters, which um, because we pick this conformal primary basis, um, take a particular form. And then they are integrated over the celestial sphere with the soft operator, which are given by these expressions. And so the symmetry um, parameters oh, I, here, that are particular functions here, are in some sense okay, green think, function uh, that. Okay, I think that answers the question. So you have to integrate yes. this of graviton over the celestial sphere to get the uh, something that you can predict. The soft charges are a celestial sphere integral here. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. And I, do I have time for a quick uh, second question? Yes. I have. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, this it's about the dressing on the your penultimate slide. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I always ask this question. So this is in, in the top line, this is dressing function uh, phi j of uh, k that mm -hmm. sits inside the integral. And and, and like that, yeah, the, 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 the dressing uh, is doesn't uh, to be fully specified, you need to give this function. So So you choose function one. Yeah. And like that, yeah. My question was what you what you choose, but I see it on the slide, so I can ask the follow question. What's the? This means that the exponential is scaleless. Like there's no UV cutoff. Like, doesn't that make the integral UV divergent? Well, so actually, so let me maybe go to some backup slides. So, um, okay, let me see here. So this, if you just take the leading dressing, this renders the infrared divergent uh, celestial bare amplitude finite. Well, and infrared finite, but is it, is it UV finite? My question. Ah, okay, uh, okay, it, okay. It, 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 it's easy to replace yeah. the IR divergence by UV divergence by multiplying by the scale invariant okay, object. So, but I am wondering what yeah, to do so with is, the UV now. So um, this is something I mentioned in the uh, beginning of the talk. Um, the celestial amplitudes broke both the UV and the IR, and so, for example, even the four graviton amplitude is uh, is divergent, and so you need to. Uh, to use some UV um, um, completion. For example, if you do string theory, then this UV divergence gets uh, soft. So the, then the amplitudes make sense. But if you just use the classical um, four-point graviton correlator and you pre-level and you do a Mellon transform, the amplitude is not, not finite. So in that sense, this is an interesting playground where you need to understand a little more than, than just uh, uh, infrared physics in order to even write down uh, things that appear sensible in the momentum basis. Okay, so that the, the spirit here somehow is that this will not work in Young Mills, but somehow here you don't no, mind Young that Mills you dress. Even better. And Young Mills is marginally convergent because so if you do these Mellon integrals, um, all the the once you perform all the Mellon integrals, you get uh, as the last interval that you have to do, you get a distribution which. Um, is in some sense a remnant of the energy momentum conserving conserve delta function. But then for gravity amplitude, because the powers of energy are different, the, uh, the exponent in the Mellon integrals gets shifted. And so this no longer is just a, a simple distribution yeah. when- Anyway, uh, we, can talk, we can, we can, we can talk later, but we can talk later because I, I, I'm not sure you see what I'm worried about. Okay, okay, yeah. yeah. Let's do that. Yeah. Yes, I think we, in fact, we need to, to move on to the next speaker. So let me thank Andrea uh, again for.